DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware, makers of better things for better living through chemistry, presents The Cavalcade of America. Tonight, The Long Gray Line, the story of West Point through 150 years. Our star, Cornell Wilde. commencement day at West Point. Again this year, as for generations past, the Corps of Cadets has gathered about the pedestal of a statue in the southwest corner of the plain, and the songs of the cadet choir have echoed back from the Hudson Highlands, as West Pointers of today recall with reverence the long gray line of those who have climbed the hill and walked the plain before them. The statue's pediment bears a simple inscription. It reads, Colonel Thayer, father of the military academy. The year is 1817. Brevet Major Sylvanus Thayer, newly appointed superintendent of the young and struggling academy, has arrived at the point. At the top of the long, steep hill up from the river, he meets the man he is to replace. Good evening, Captain Partridge. My hand, sir. No? Well, then, Captain. You are reporting to me, Brevet Major Thayer. Let me remind you, this is an engineer post. Rank within the Corps of Engineers is substantive. Your Brevet Field rank is of no account here. But I hardly I thought... rank you, sir. Let's have that understood. Now, what's your business? I have a message for you, Captain, from Brigadier General Swift. Here it is. Hmm. On receipt, this you will deli deliver the command of the post of West Point. <laughs> Preposterous. Preposterous. Me superseded? Never, sir. Never. Good day to you, sir. I congratulate you, Major, on your forbearance with old Pewter. Uh, with Captain Partridge, sir. I prefer not to make a stormy beginning, Lieutenant. Quietly, does it? Now that the gentleman has been taken in charge by the War Department, we can get about our business. May I see the entrance examination records for the current year? There are no records, sir. What? And no examinations. Old Pewter, uh, begging your pardon, sir, he decided everything. We have one cadet here who's only 11 years old. 11? Yes, sir. And another one nearly 40. That one has one arm and a wife up in Newburgh. Old Pute was fond of him. This is outrageous, Lieutenant. Outrageous. Yes, sir. The cadets are graduated when they please, sir. If old Pute approves. If he doesn't approve, they don't stay long. You will call him Captain Partridge, Lieutenant. Until and unless the court-martial decides differently. We shall have order here, Lieutenant. Strict order. Discipline shall be the core of our new system. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, sir. Lieutenant, I've just returned from a tour of the military schools of Europe. I've seen the low esteem in which American military men are held abroad. By heaven, sir, we'll change that. We'll build here a school founded on the rock of discipline, nourished by scientific learning and exalted in the philosophy of honor. Duty, honor, country. That shall be our watchword. In his long years at West Point, Sylvanus Thayer, 
turned an academic shambles into the first and finest engineering school on the American continent. Here he shaped four generations of cadets into builders and soldiers imbued with his own ideals, duty, honor, country. He was the first of our great teachers of the art of victory, Sylvanus Thayer. We sons of today, we salute you, you sons of an earlier day. We follow the order behind you, where you have pointed the way. And the second great teacher, Dennis Hart Mahan, son of an Irish immigrant carpenter, small, sickly, a wisp of a man, constantly ill in the sub-zero highland winters. Dennis Hart Mahan, mentor of Captains Courageous. The year is 1841, just past a century ago. Place, a West Point classroom. A section reciting in trigonometry has an unexpected visitor. Now, gentlemen, I want you to... Colonel Mahan. Uh, uh, take seat, take seat, gentlemen. It is a pleasure, sir. Come in, come in. It's a nuisance, a new night. Oh, go right on with your recitation. Let me take your cloak, Colonel. Oh, no, no. <coughs> Seems I'm always cold. Uh, matter of fact, that's why I dropped in. The classes are over. But I, I couldn't quite head into that mountain wind and fight my way home. Well, now that you're here, sir, I wonder if you wouldn't care to say a few words to the section. Uh, very well. I'll make a complete nuisance of myself. Uh, gentlemen, uh, these are second-year men, Captain. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, gentlemen, you'll not have the excruciating pleasure of attending my own lectures for another year. If you're here another year... <laughs> Now, I'd not gainsay the importance of trigonometry and such elementals. It's all well to measure all things. But ultimately, you're here to learn how to move armies in the field, in the presence of enemy forces. I uh, presume to teach this art. I wonder at my own presumption. Wonder, too, uh, if any of you already read my textbook on the subject. Uh, <coughs> good. <coughs> Uh, you there. You, sir, sitting alone in the back row. Me, sir? Uh, sorry, gentlemen, I don't know all your names as yet. Uh, yes, you, sir. Can you tell me what is the chief element of success in strategy? Celerity, sir. Speed of movement. Correct, sir. Could you uh, develop that theme a bit now? Yes, sir. As you have written, sir. No great success can be hoped for in war in which rapid movements do not enter. Even the very elements of nature seem to array themselves against the slow and overprudent general. Excellent. Celerity, gentlemen. Celerity. Never forget the word. Oh, the hour is up, eh? Yes, sir. Sorry, sir. Class dismissed, gentlemen. <laughs> uh, celerity. Well, Captain, they took me at my word. Uh, always the cadet who spoke with such, uh, such presence. Uh, Sam Grant, sir, class of 43. Sam Grant, eh? Uh, that's what everyone calls him. I, I believe his full name is Ulysses Simpson Grant. Celerity. Blitzkrieg, the Nazis were to call it a century later when they stabbed into Poland... Mahan called it celerity a hundred years ago, and he made it the heart and soul of American prowess and skill at arms. Dennis Hart Mahan, the teacher, never fought a battle, and even never went out of doors, they say, without an umbrella. But he rode with Stonewall Jackson's foot cavalry down the Shenandoah Valley. He planned with Lee at Chancellorsville, and his counsel prevailed before Vicksburg with General U.S. Grant. Though long dead... He was at San Juan Hill, at San Miguel, too, and the dim shell-wracked forests of the Argonne. He fought with Eisenhower for Operation Overlord. He rode MacArthur's transport back to the Philippines. With Bradley, he conquered the deadly hedgerows at San Lo. 
and in his name, George Patton's iron column, slicing through the Falaise Gap, rolled madly down the roads of France to reach for the distant Rhine, Celerity, and Dennis Hart Mahan. The Cavalcade of America, Cornell Wilde is telling the story of the Long Gray Line. The Long Gray Line of our stretches through the years of the centuries fall, and the last man feels through his marrow the grip of your far off home. Sayer, Mahan, and Peter Smith Mikey. This was the son of a Scottish mechanic who made West Point the home of engineering science. Graduated at the outbreak of the war between the states, he rose in three years to the field rank of brigadier general while still a first lieutenant in the regular army list. Returning to the point, he stayed to teach and to build for nearly 40 years. Peter Smith Mikey, soldier and scientist. Here is 1888, 64 years ago. The place, Colonel Mikey's office at the academy on a warm day in early autumn. The teacher is revising his elements of hydromechanics as... Dennis, Dennis, boy. How do I look, Dad? Oh, well, son, you're, you're dressed in gray, but... Uh, no, 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 you, you don't look much like a cadet, sir. Pull in that midsection, boy. Uh, yes, sir. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Do you remember Sylvanus Thayer's rule? Uh, display the chest, draw on the corporation, draw the chin in perpendicular to the chest, hold the hands down to touch the seam of the pantaloons, and take care not to bend the elbows. Keep the shoulders back and keep the feet at an angle of 45 degrees. How's this? <laughs> it's better, lad, it's better. But you got four years to go. Now, you, uh, you wanted to talk with me? Yes, Dad. About football. Football? That English nonsense? Well, this is a new game, sir. We played it at Lawrenceville last year. This is not Lawrenceville, boy. Well, uh, they're playing this new game at Princeton and Rutgers, too. Civilian colleges have time for such frivolities. We do not. I uh, hear they've been practicing at Annapolis, sir. Oh? Oh, they have, have they? Uh, yes, sir. And, well, sir, we compete for grades, and it's supposed to be good for us. Why not in games, too? Oh, Oh, very well. I'll take it up with General Park and the academic board. But in my day, we got along well enough with rowing on the river. Times change, Dad. Do they, Dennis? Do they? <laughs> well, on a fine Indian summer day like this, time seems to me to stand still here among the old gray towers. Or rather, all the times are mixed up together into one time. The hills behind us flatten out into one dimension, like a, like a backdrop in a stage play. And time narrows down to a single split second. Yes. I think I know what you mean, Dad. Aye. <laughs> and old Sylvanus is, is still handing out demerits in his basement office over yonder. And you might bump into Jackson or Grant or Lee in any sally port. And Dennis Mahan... Why, he's wheezing up the hill right now, home for a sail on the river. <laughs> I don't know what he'd say about this football kicking. In this new game, Dad, you, you run with the ball. Old Mahan would probably figure out new ways to run with it uh, from the sidelines. Well, oh. oh, I suppose it can't do any harm. But, son, never lose sight of why you're here. 
Times can't change that. Dennis Mahan named his son for Sylvanus Thayer. I named you for Dennis Mahan. You see, things run together here in a cord of life without a break. And the strands of the cord are beauty, honor, country. Navy won the first football game in 1890, 24 to nothing. But Army, captained by Dennis Mahan Mikey, won the second game, 32 to 16. High on the hilltop, there's a stadium now named for Dennis, Mikey Stadium. There's a few years later, there's a, a little war on down in Cuba, the war with Spain. We are once more in Colonel Mikey's office. I came, sir, as soon as I heard about your son, William. My deepest sympathy, sir. I, I, thank you. It was pneumonia. They could do nothing. I'm, uh, I'm writing now to Dennis. You have been spared Dennis, Colonel. You must hang on to that. I, I do, I do. We're all proud of him. His record in Cuba is superb, sir. I, he learned this lesson well here at the academy. Uh, come in. A message, sir, from the War Department. From the War Department? Here, let me see it. Here it is, sir. Ah. Oh. No. No. What is it? Uh, here, you... You read it, Colonel. We regret to inform you that your son, First Lieutenant Dennis Mahan Mikey has been killed in action at San Juan Hill. Peter Smith Mikey died some months later on February 16th, 1901. The class of Ort One was graduated on the morning of the 18th, and to a man, the class remained that afternoon to follow Mikey to his grave. The last of the great triumvirate, Thayer, Mahan, Mikey, was gone. But the cord with three strands, duty, honor, country, was unbroken. The long gray line would go marching on. They are here in ghostly assemblage, the men of the corps long dead. These were three great teachers of the art of victory. There were and have been many more. And what of those who were taught and learned well the lesson? They march past now. We hear their ghostly tread and their voices as all times melt and merge into one time. How can we call out the names and count off by the numbers when the numbers are so great? We'll try, at least, as the endless column passes. George Ronan, class of 1811, the first West Pointer killed in action at a wilderness fort where Chicago now stands. George W. Whistler, 1819, pioneer railroad builder. Let him stand for all the West Pointers who forged steel bands across the continent. Edgar Allan Poe, that most melancholy cadet, Henry DuPont, manufacturer. James Abbott McNeil Whistler, artist and wit, son of the railroad builder. And all the great fighting names, the general officers. Sherman, Sheridan, Beauregard, Pickett, Polk, and Jubal Early. Jefferson Davis, 1828, McClellan, Burnside, Hooker, and Meade. Thomas Jonathan Stonewall Jackson, class of 1846. Let us cross over the river and 
rest under the shade of the trees. And Andrew S. Rowan, 81, who carried a message to Garcia. Blackjack Pershing, Liggett, March and Bullard, Hap Arnold, Buckner, Patton, McNair. So the high command goes by. But for every star or eagle in this march past, a thousand shoulders carry short gold bars. These are the platoon leaders passing now, and the company commanders, expendable in every army since Joshua fought the Battle of Jericho. Take to report, sir. All the cannoneers are killed. Can you spare me another crew, sir, and two more guns? That was Lieutenant John P. J. O'Brien of O'Brien's battery at the Battle of Buena Vista in Mexico, the perishing, imperishable subaltern. Those who pass now are the men who take nameless but numbered hills and die in the taking. These are the flyers into the flak, the flak that was never predicted. These are the men who straighten out in the glare of star shells certain slightly annoying salients in the regimental front. Hello. Hello, Brigade Command. Three prisoners, sir, and all from the same Bavarian Lobsdale Regiment. Thank you, sir. Yes, we lost one officer, a lieutenant, sir. Lieutenants, captains, these are the chewers out with tails well chewed in turn. These are the men who were on the right spot by the map and the clock when the barrage came down some 30 yards too close to the trench. The men who capture not cities, but machine gun nests, who lead the platoon on point across the unswept minefield, who wait in the moonless dark for the bonsai charge. Hello. Hello, this is Baker Company, sir. I guess we're where we're supposed to be, but we'll need stretcher bearers. The captain's headed, sir. These are the men who have done the dirty work of command in the filthy business of war for 150 years. The men who were trained for these necessary tasks at West Point. No need to go back to Buena Vista or Chancellorsville or San Juan Hill or the Argonne or Saipan or the hedgerows of Normandy. This line of marches grows longer now day by day. Let these three stand for the many hundreds. Lieutenant John Trent, class of 1950, captain of football, 1949, killed in action in Korea. Lieutenant George Hannon, class of 1950, distinguished service cross, killed in action in Korea. Lieutenant Samuel Corson, Class of 1949, Congressional Medal of Honor, killed in action in Korea. Thanks to Cornell Wilde and the Cavalcade players for tonight's story, The Long Gray Line.
Tonight's Dupont Cavalcade was written by George H. Faulkner and based on material from Where They Have Trod and Men of West Point by Colonel R. Ernest Dupuy, USA Retired. Original music was composed by Arden Cornwell, conducted by Donald Voorhees. The program was directed by John Zoller. With Cornell Wilde, you heard Stott Cotsworth as Thayer, Richard Purdy as Mahan, Mercer McLeod as Mikey, and the Don Craig Chorus. This is Cy Harris speaking. <laughs> Next week, the DuPont Cavalcade will present the story of America's first woman pilot. Be sure to listen to Daughter with Wings, starring Joan Caulfield. The DuPont Cavalcade of America came to you tonight from the Velasco Theater in New York City and is sponsored by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware, makers of better things for better living through chemistry. Tonight, it's Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator, on NBC. Mm.